Hello and welcome to PS On Air, where writers from Project Syndicate meet the newspapers that publish them. I'm Anatole Kaletsky, and today we have with us Yanis Varoufakis, the former finance minister of Greece in the crucial period when it was negotiating with the IMF and the European Union, and now a co-founder of DiEM25. We also have uh, David Alandete, managing editor of El Pais, and Torsten Rika, international correspondent of Handelsblatt. As we're in London, I'd like to start off uh, talking to you about Brexit and what, if anything, Britain can learn from the experience that Greece had in negotiating its uh, conflictual relationship with the EU. The main lesson is uh, to avoid at all cost a negotiation for the right to negotiate, a right that would not be granted, with uh, substantial costs on each side of the English Channel. And the way to avoid that is for the Prime Minister to make up her mind. Either withdraw from the negotiations, which I do not recommend because that would be uh, seriously del deleterious to the interests of the people of Britain and the interests of the people of Europe, or to make Mr. Barnier and his team redundant. And the only way to do how this... Do you do that? <laughs> well, how about filing an application for an, a European Economic Area, Norway-style agreement interim agreement that lasts, let's say, five years, which is equivalent of uh, the term of uh, British Parliament, uh, to kick off immediately after the end of the two-year post-Article 50 triggering period. That way, uh, firstly, Ms. Mrs. Merkel is going to relax because uh, the, you know, the problem shifts to the next Chancellor in 2024. Uh, secondly, um, there is no issue about contributions to the EU budget, there is no issue about freedom of movement, there is no issue about uh, European courts uh, jurisdiction in Britain. And actually, in a sense, this is the best way of serving the philosophical argument in favour of Brexit, the Burkean argument about the importance of restoring to the House of Commons full sovereignty, because this is the only way of making the House sovereign in the decision of to, as to what the EU-UK relationship must be in the future. Uh, and suddenly, the heat get, goes away and some light may shine through. That's very interesting, Yanis, because to some extent that is, what, that is the policy on which uh, some of the crucial parties in Britain are converging. To some extent, it's like the Labour Party policy and Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, is also moving towards that direction. Torsten, how do you think that would be received in Germany if Britain turned around now and said, all right, we want to stay in a Norway-style arrangement for an extended period? I think uh, especially uh, Chancellor Merkel would be happy to hear that because this was actually postponed the uh, uh, day of reckoning a bit. Uh, it wouldn't probably change the, the final decision because uh, after five years you have to make a decision. It would be easier, I, I think, uh, after five years um, than after two years. But uh, on the other hand, I would like to turn the question around. So is there anything the Greek people can learn from the Brexit experience so far? Because it was quite a painful experience after the vote last year. And do you think there's any lesson for, for Greece here to learn? Is there are lessons for all of us Europeans. But maybe the lesson you want to elicit from me <laughs> with your question yeah. Yeah. concerns uh, w how to conduct a negotiation when, unlike Britain, which is perfectly sustainable as a country, your own country is unsustainable, mm -hmm. laboring under a quadruple insolvency, an insolvent state, insolvent banks, insolvent yeah. corporations, and insolvent households, right? My own view on this has always been the same, that when you have the weak bargaining position, uh, you must never bluff and you must never issue threats, but you should state very clearly what your preference ordering is. This is something I tried to carry the government I served for along with me but I failed. I didn't manage to, con to convince the Greek Prime Minister. David, would you, have, would you like to come in on this point? Yeah, um, I was actually uh, thinking about uh, how the Greek experience is an example now for people who are negotiating or are trying to negotiate here in the United Kingdom 
your latest book is used here. Uh, I, I believe it's called Adults in the Room. It's used as a <laughs> model of how to negotiate, as an example. But there's something there that, uh, that I think m maybe you can reflect on, which is how to explain to the people the trade-offs that are going to come, which are very difficult and are very tough. And it's my impression that we're not always clear in Greece. You know? Firstly, just for the purposes of uh, disclosure, I was a Remain supporter. So because I, I thought that the costs, political, moral, economic, were great, much greater uh, from, from leaving than from remaining, this is why. But now I think it's absolutely essential to understand that the calculus of cost and benefit, of trade-offs, as you put it, is not fixed. You know what the, p the greatest mistake that everybody in Britain seems to be making, in my estimation? They all assume that the EU is a given. It's a fixed entity. It's like a club. It's a given club. And the question for the people of Britain, do we want to belong to this club or not? And this is a big mistake because the EU is work in progress. Mm -hmm. The EU cannot remain as it is. It is uh, either it's going to disintegrate or it's going to reintegrate in a different way. Therefore, the purpose of my proposal for a five, seven year transition period is not simply mm. so that trade-offs can be worked out and uh, the, the uh, relationship can be worked out, but so that Britain and the EU transform themselves simultaneously with the hidden hope that in 2025 um, a, f a different Britain is going to want to rejoin a democratized and reformed EU. On monetary policy, you've recently written a very interesting article on Project Syndicate, which suggested that governments should get involved directly in the creation of money uh, because central banks are no longer truly independent. You say, give governments a greater say in domestic money cr creation and indeed greater independence from the central bank by establishing a parallel payment system based on fiscal money, or more precisely, money backed by future taxes. But is this really all about, when it comes down to it, allowing governments to run bigger budget deficits? Is that, is that really all it's about, or is there something else to it? N not, not in the slightest. It's got nothing to do with uh, bolstering the capacity, giving more degrees of freedom to government to run budget deficits. It's got to do with allowing governments greater degrees of freedom when it comes to liquidity. It's not the same thing. And Let's face it, in the Eurozone, most of the money is created by private banks anyway. It's not pro provide, created even by the central bank. The central bank creates a small amount of money which, then, which is then massively turbocharged by a financial sector that has, have, has had a very bad history of uh, you know, just going completely berserk. Mm -hmm. And at the very same time, when those banks uh, go bankrupt, then you have this uh, cynical shift of losses from their books onto the shoulders of taxpayers under conditions of austerity that reduce the incomes from which the states and the governments must repay the, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the costs of saving the bankers. Mm -hmm. The idea about a parallel payment system in the Eurozone is meant, this is how I mean it, as a means of, of effectively strengthening the Eurozone not disintegrating this and I need to make this mm -hmm. very clear this st the, 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 the very strict separation of two ideas a parallel currency which you introduce when you want to effectively mo move away from the euro yeah. and a parallel payment system which works as follows I was pl planning to introduce this in Greece uh, it never came to being but the idea was this firstly in Greece we have a lot of arrears between between private entities, individuals or companies, and between the state and private entities, and private en entities and the state. So imagine you use the web interface of the tax office uh, under every tax file number to create uh, a deposit account, and in that account to simply type the money that the state owes private Actors. So it does not create more credit, but it creates more liquidity. Creates mm -hmm. more liquidity. Mm -hmm. 
and then they can use it, they can keep this liquidity to repay future taxes, taxes in the future. And if they keep it for a year, then, then they, get, they get a discount, which is effectively allowing uh, an interest rate on fiscal money, which is different from that of the central bank, uh, that effectively offers tax relief mm -hmm. to those who participate in the, in, uh, in the increases in the liquidity. How do the politicians, the people in government, avoid the accusations that they are actually trying to control you know, the, the flow of, of money and control to influence over the central banks? Like This would be political, politically toxic for many governments. Well, firstly, notice that the system that I'm, I'm advocating is a closed system within a jurisdiction, like in Spain. Okay. So this system would only apply to taxpayers in Spain. So the liquidity that we would be creating, Spaniards would not be able to take out of the system and spend it on a BMW or a Mercedes-Benz. Yeah? It can only be spent amongst taxpayers in Spain. It's euro-denominated, it's not a different currency, but it's the kind of IOUs that can be exchanged only locally. There's no control of the government over the central bank? Not, none at all. Okay. None at all. The, 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 bank, the, the government effectively bypasses, in a way, the money markets uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with citizens. But it's a closed system which does two things. Firstly, it makes the central bank's life easier because Mario Draghi does not, no longer need to bend his rules. Secondly, it... Um, makes any potential breakup of the Eurozone less painful. Torsten, what do you think would be the reaction in Germany? It would be awful, I have to say. I mean, um, I found it interesting from an academic point of view. Um, but I mean, you have to think about how do you solve it politically. And as you said, this is a closed system. You need some kind of country to, to deal with in the first place. Otherwise, it's not going to show anything to anybody. Um, as far as you touch the independence of the European uh, Central Bank or even tell people the state would be allowed to create some money, be it for liquidity reasons or whatever, it would be very hard to solve this politically in, in, in Germany. You know, so how, how would you just, sell just, it? Just, just one more thought. And I don't see the, the, the need, the urgency at the moment that we need some kind of safeguard uh, mechanism in for a breakup of the Eurozone. Allow me to answer the, the two points you made. Firstly, how do you convince a people, not just the Germans, the Greeks, the French, about any idea? Through dialogue, through reasoned debate that bypasses uh, prejudice. What you mentioned is a prejudice. We need to bypass it simply by asking our friends in Germany. Uh, by the way, not all Germans would respond this way. And one of the persons that I've been discussing this uh, is a famous German economist, Thomas Mayer, who used to be chief economist at Deutsche Bank. We worked together on this idea. So it's, uh, if you want it, as much a German idea as it is a Greek idea. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, what would I say to my fr friends in Germany about this? Look, why would you object to a situation where when the Greek state owes a, pharmaceutical, a Greek pharmaceutical company a million euros, and doesn't have the liquidity to give it. Instead of going cap in hand to Draghi and asking him to bend his rules to, to create that one billion, million, which is what he's doing now, um, effectively, he gives an IOU, the Greek state gives an IOU to the Greek pharmaceutical uh, company, which is electronic through the, ta the tax system web phase. And then that pharmaceutical company, if it owes, say, 500,000 to a supplier, can pass this IOU to a, to, to, to a Greek supplier who can then pay workers, who can then yeah. go to the supermarket and buy stuff. Why does this interfere with central bank independence and why is this a problem for Germany? It's actually good for Germany to do this. This is my answer mm -hmm. to that. On the second question, I can see the, your point that over the last few months there has been a great deal of celebration in Europe that the crisis is over. The crisis is not over. I'm experiencing a deja vu feeling. It is like 2002. Remember about a year after the, the dot-com bubble burst when loose money made people feel, and commentators, and some very clever commentators, that, oh, false alarm, it's all fantastic. And that was what spearheaded under the surface the uh, stretching out of all the imbalances that led us to 2008. I believe that Europe is now being threatened by this form of complacency, by the false sense of having overcome the crisis. I agree that the crisis isn't over yet, but uh, if you look at the numbers, growth numbers, uh, I just did before our, our conversation here, they are going up. If you look at unemployment, they are going down. So it's not just a feeling. Well, Europe is becoming a place where the numbers are prospering and the people are suffering. 
Uh, and, and, and this is also, th to, for, me, for me, this is even worse because, you see, it allows our political class to be more complacent. Yes, unemployment is falling, but the quality of good jobs is also falling. Precariousness is rising. Inequality is becoming toxic. This is only going to give rise to right-wing populism and xenophobia. That's all we have time for. Yanis Varoufakis, Torsten Rieke, David Aldente, thank you very much for coming to London for this event, and thank you for watching PS On Air.